is going to talk about Ephesians chapter 2 and Colossians 2. And then Ephesians chapter 2 is where we're just going to read first, uh, starting in verse 11 of Ephesians chapter 2. It says, Wherefore remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, he's talking to Gentiles, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in, that's our location we got to be, in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made near by the blood of Christ. For he is our, who's the our, and we discussed that last week, is the Jew, Gentile, we, and us, and our of Ephesians. That's the we, the us, the our, is Jew and Gentile. Because Paul's a Jew. So when he's talking to Gentile, he says our, Paul's classifying Israel, and Gentiles have been made one through the blood of Christ. But now in Christ Jesus, verse 13, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. So verse 15, I'm just going to write that here, not the whole verse, but this is a verse I want to, I want to uh, relate to what I'm going to be talking about in just a few minutes. So there's these laws contained in ordinances that he did what with in verse 15? He abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that he could make out of two one new man, so making peace. Now what set the Jews apart from the Gentiles, the Gentile world? What was so different about the Jews and Gentiles? It's how they lived. How did the Jews live? They had laws and commandments and ordinances that Gentiles did not follow. Food laws, clothing, um, such as shrimp or mixed fabric laws. Uh, people today mock those things and think Christianity is silly or the Bible is silly because they condemn the eating of shrimp or mixed fabrics. And so that's something that set the Jews apart was God gave them uh, laws. Uh, for example, there's like the three ways that you break down the laws of God. Well, there's the... And none of them work, so we'll have to just buy some. <laughs> so there's the civil, there's the ceremonial, and then there's the there's the um, religious laws. You know, they had when God created Israel, He wasn't just creating a, a spiritual movement, but He was creating a nation. He was creating a United States, if you will, with with a legal document, with laws and ordinances, and how His people were to live in the world amidst people that didn't live like that. So there were things that set the Jews apart from the Gentiles that made them completely different, that made them separate from, that made them uh, even averse to people that weren't like them. For example, we know about the Samaritans and the Jews' relationship was very bad. And we know how oftentimes you see some of the faithful Jews when you go into the New Testament, how they approach and view Jews like or non-Jews, like dogs they call them or other related terms. Um, so we see that there's there was a separation between the Jew-Gentile relationship. There was this separation between the two of them. And God came through Jesus Christ to break that down, to remove that wall between the two, so that he could do what? Make one, if this were one unit here, a Jew and Gentile, a we, a us, an hour, all in Jesus Christ. And to Paul's point, he shows that in Romans 1, Romans 2, all of sin comes short of the glory of God, whether you're a Jew, whether you're a Gentile. So you all need the blood of Jesus Christ. So you all need to be made one in Jesus. And so Paul's trying to get him to see that. You all need to be one in Christ. And this is Paul's point in Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of two one new man, 
so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were near. For through him we both, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye, talking to the Gentiles, are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed groweth together into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. So we see that there's this enmity between the Jew Gentile free relationship. And this rift shows itself all throughout the early church's history. Does anyone remember Acts chapter 15 and what happened there? Remember, a James and John and Peter and others had a big meeting in Jerusalem over this one question. Do Gentiles have to keep Jewish principles in order to be followers of Jesus? Because there were people going around preaching Jesus, but they were preaching you had to become a Jew in your conduct and practice to be a follower of Jesus. So they were still holding on to these laws and commandments and ordinances that made them unique and were still applying them on Gentiles rather than preaching the cross, preaching the blood of Christ, and all these things that make us one. So this was being neglected still for this. And they were applying that on the Gentiles. And so the debate was in Acts 15, what does a Gentile have to be? Is this, and I said this last week, is this going to be a Jewish church, a Gentile church, or are we just going to be the church? And that was the debate Paul had. Paul was a very able man to preach to the Jews, but he went to the Gentiles. And Peter was uniquely for the Jews, as you see in their relationship as they went along. So, Paul's very passionate for his people to see the fact of God's promise all along, which was salvation for the world, whether you're Jew, whether you're Gentile. They, the mystery of God, and he says that in chapter 3 of Ephesians, and we're not going to read it, is the church, this one body in Christ, made up of every man all over the world that is in Jesus, is the Jew and Gentile relationship in the church. The church is God's one body, two, uh, made up of two, so making peace between Jew and Gentile. So the whole point, we that's easy for us today to understand because we've heard this a million times in Sunday school or in a sermon, and it's all through grace and this and that and that sort of thing. And that's easy for us to see, but this wasn't where they were in the early church. This was what was going on. Here in America, we're almost by and large all Gentiles for the most part. So this is easy for us to get. We've got 2,000 years of hearing the gospel. So we've understood by this point in time, surely, that we get this. But they didn't. And even Israel today doesn't get this, by and large. And so uh, this is a big point for Paul. It's a big point for us today. So I want to go to Colossians chapter 2 and discuss a point that is often made that relates to verse 15. Ephesians chapter 2, that's 15. So we've talked about this. Remember that phrase, laws and ordinances? This will help us to maybe understand it a little better. Okay, are we still, the Bible says we are not under the law, but we're under grace. What does that mean? Does that mean we don't have any law to follow? At all? We're not under the law, but we're under grace. I know that's it's Romans 6. What does that phrase make you think of whenever I say that? Anybody? I know what it means, but I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> say like what we you still have, we're still We still have the law. And Jesus said he didn't come to do away with the law. Oh, good point. Um, 
So we still have the law, and it's like a guideline, though. Right. Rather than, like, you know, it, Jesus made it more about what we are to do rather than what we're not to do. Mm-hmm. If we walk in love, if we walk in Christ, then we fulfill the law. 100%. That's Romans 13 that you're quoting it and to the T. See, people will take these things, like Ephesians 2.15 the laws of commandments and ordinances, saying that Jesus abolished that in his body. They'll take Colossians 2, 13 and 14, which we're about to read, and they will use these verses to teach, that in Romans 6 especially, that we're not under any laws or principles. The Bible is clear, where there is no law, there's no sin. Jesus said that, and the Bible quotes him as saying, where there is no law, there's no transgression. And so... We understand that if there is no law, Jesus' mission on the cross in making two, one, Jew and Gentile, was to do away with everything that he ever said prior to the gospel. If that was his mission, then killing isn't a sin today on the basis of any law. If the law was done away with, there can be no sin, which is where some people today even teach. And this is part of even a church in Ashland. You know, you no one sins. We it's it's we're all already saved. We're all already children of God. The law was done away with in Jesus, so we're all fine. Just we just don't realize it yet. And Jesus abolished the law. They'll say, so they become a lawless gospel. But that's why you know Jesus had to come because to make that sacrifice because nobody. It was to show the law, but nobody could keep the law completely. That's why they had to be sacrifices back then. And that's why Jesus come as the as the final sacrifice to give that grace and that mercy that we no longer have to make sacrifices because he was the final sacrifice because it's only through him can we fulfill that law. It's only by him and through his spirit can we do that. We can't do that on our own. That's why he had to come. Well, of course. Yeah, I wouldn't go as far to say they couldn't keep the law, which is why they were blamed and sent to hell for not doing so. Well, no, but, but because they did it, right? Because they did it, God gave them a graceful path of atonement through the sacrificial system. Even to rebels, He gave the opportunity to but, change. But that's why He had to come, because only through His Spirit can we do that. Of course, Romans eight, we keep the law through the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, hit, hit through the cross, the gospel message. Our hearts are circumcised, not just our outward conduct, so that we keep the law uh, naturally, like Delina said, as we walk in love. There's really one thing we've got to worry about right now, and that is loving God and really, too, loving my neighbor. And if my heart is set on those and I do those things, everything else works itself out. But the issue is here, the, 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 laws of, the law of love towards God, like uh, towards God, and towards my uh, neighbor, I think I spelled that right. I'm not sure if I did. Uh, you know, we're obligated to walk in love towards them both. But Jesus said, these two, off of these two, still hangs everything else. This only is our obligation because of all of this. If, it, if this didn't exist no more, this loses all meaning as well. Because what is love if there's no, what is even love at the end of the day if there's no principles that expose what love is or isn't? How do I know if it's loving to kill or to save if I don't know it's wrong to kill and right to save? And when I know what's right, I know what's loving. I know what's the right thing to do. I know what's the loving thing to do. So the law of love only is binding on us because there's the, all these other things. These things weren't abolished or done away with when Jesus came. He fulfilled the law. And that's a whole other discussion. But the point is, the reason we're obligated to love, or the way Jesus put it, was to love God and your neighbor. Because this is what this was meant to promote. All these principles and all these things down here. The Old Testament says God gave them all these commandments for their good, that it might be well with them and with their children always. That it might be well, that that might be good for them, that they might be blessed. 
So these commands down here were not impossible. And Isaiah says that. Deuteronomy says that. But they were to show them a way that the law lacked influence to get their hearts to want to obey. The law lacked the power to influence them. There was no... The, the cross and its grace is what really gets people's attention. It's what wins their heart to want to do what is right. It's what captures their attention. But the law, of the, the law had the power, like the scripture says, to condemn them. It had power to kill, but it lacked the power to save. So people take this whole discussion about Jesus abolishing the laws and the ordinances which were supposed to mean making a Jew and Gentile one person, and they take that to mean there's now no law at all. And so that's what's called as antinomianism or anti-nomos, anti-law. So uh, you'll have, that's a large part of the Christian movement today, you know, that there is no, there is no law. Well, so, how do they explain away Jesus saying that, though, that he didn't come to do away with the law? Yeah. I never get a decent answer from them. Usually, they go down some other trail of discussion or argument or debate, or they just don't acknowledge that point. Or, you know, they say, oh, well, that's true, but... And then they go on into whatever else they want to talk about. So you never really get someone to actually answer you typically there, unless you're talking to someone who's you know, humble and honest to think about what everyone's saying. And that's not usually found in today's society very often. So... We find in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, this same thing I've been saying discussed from a different perspective or light. Colossians 2, 13, 14 says, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together, that's Jew and Gentile, he's speaking to Gentiles right now, with him, Jesus, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, that was against us, which was contrary to us, Jew and Gentile, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore, that's a connecting term, therefore, judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days which are but shadows of things to come, but the body is of Christ. And so, this whole debate then continues. This discussion continues. The law was not done away with. Delina made great points. Shannon made great points about why that is. Jesus didn't come to do away with the law. The question really is, the Bible says Jesus abolished something. He stopped something. And the same phrase in Ephesians 2.15 is repeated here. In Colossians 2.14, I don't know if you can, probably cannot read that. Handwriting of ordinances. Number one, this is not the same thing as law. It's not the same thing. It's not the same word. We have to define what are these ordinances that Jesus abolished. And the reason this is important is because of the, especially the Greek, there's an argument over whether or not this means debt. And this goes back to the, where we've been talking about the cross and the atonement for some time. And I will state why that is. So we, the word they focus on is the word handwriting in this verse here. Handwriting. And it's only, this word there for handwriting is only used one time in the entire New Testament. Right here. Only once. And it's the word charygraphon, which is the compound of two Greek words, which means hand and to grave, scrape, scratch, and grave, write down, record. Charygraphon in Colossians 2.14 is thusly translated as handwriting. The term charygraphon is used to denote a legal document or an important document, such as a bond or a note of hand, which acknowledges that money has either been deposited with him or lent to him who wrote it. So the word has a legal connotation to it, charygraphon, handwriting. Usually in their, in their day, okay, they didn't have printing press yet. So if they wrote something down, it was engraving by their hand on a rock or a stone or maybe parchment, a lot of work. So it was important documents that were wrote down or people who had a lot of time on their hands. 
like the priests who would do religious documents, which were very important and are important. So uh, this, this discussion here of what handwriting is becomes a bit of a, 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 a hot topic. The word kerygraphon only occurs in this one place in the whole Bible. The argument of those who believe, and this is what we've been talking about, remember we've been discussing the atonement for a little while, is that uh, the subject of, remember, we discussed penal substitution, or that our debt, this is their view, this is their view, was paid. A paid debt. God was paid off. And this word has a legal connotation to it, which can at times mean a certificate of debt, or it just means an important document. An important document. In fact, it, that's exactly what the term means, an important document. So, the argument of those who believe penal substitution will make this verse out to say that our legal note of debt was transferred to Christ and he bore and paid for our legal sin debt on the cross. By taking our sin debt into himself, by misapplying verses like 1 Peter 2.24, uh, etc. What the penal substitutionist will do is attempt to say that our legal bond of debt was transferred to Christ and blotted out, having nailed our sinful debt to the cross. A point they will make is that Jesus taught us in Matthew 6.12 to pray, Father, forgive us our debts. And then in Luke 11.4, Jesus taught us to pray, forgive us our sins. They will make the point that Jesus equates sin and debt together. Thus, sin debt was transferred into and bore in Jesus' body on the tree by applying 1 Peter 2.24. In this, a proper is this a proper rendering of this verse? In my personal opinion, I believe those who appeal to Colossians 2.14 to say that our sin debt was canceled at the cross are completely missing the point of the verse and are misusing it to defend their own penal view of the atonement. So, my discussion this morning is kind of back in what we've been talking about, the atonement, but it brings into the topic, again, the Jew-Gentile relationship. Remember we talked about Romans chapter 9. And people try to use Romans chapter 9 to teach. Shannon goes to heaven, Delina goes to hell, and God chose that from eternity past, and who are you to reply against God for saying that's not fair? We, I think we discussed that, and we showed that that's ridiculous to interpret Romans 9 that way. John 6, you cannot come unto the Father unless the Father who has sent me spirit, it sends the Spirit draws him. And then they'll take that verse to apply to everybody in the world and say, well, if you didn't come to Father and you die in your sin and go to hell, it's because the Father didn't want to draw you, so he left you to your own destruction, not sending his Spirit to draw you. So I think we showed in John 6, that's not how you can interpret John 6. There's a whole other interpretation of that. There's a whole completely different way of looking at that section of Scripture. Ephesians chapter 1, they try to teach again this whole idea of the elect over here, those who God doesn't want saved over here, and they pit those against each other. Ephesians 1 is not teaching that. And they take Colossians chapter 2, specifically verse 14, and relate it to Ephesians 2.15 to teach that our legal sin debt was nailed to the cross. It's what Jesus nailed for the elect. So if you die in your sin... Your sin debt was not nailed to the cross when Jesus died. And so Jesus didn't die for that person. So the cross is not for everybody. So this can get a little heavy. But the point of it is to say, Paul here is not talking about sin debt in Colossians 2.14. He's talking about the ordinances which separated the Jew and the Gentile from being one in the church. The important legal document of God that made Israel unique, separate from Gentiles, is what was nailed to the cross in Jesus. That's what the whole debate in Ephesians 15 was about. What does a Gentile have to be to be saved? Do they have to be Jews still? Do we still not have to eat pork? Can we wear mixed fabrics now? What does a Gentile have to be? And that's us, in order to be saved. Does he have to be a Jew? Does he have to be a Gentile? Are we going to have a morning service for the Gentiles and an evening service for the Jews? Or what is this? What are we going to look like? And the whole point of Paul, and we're going to show that, he's not talking about sin debt. And people will use that verse to try to show things like limited atonement. Jesus just died for the elect. Or they'll try to use it to teach uh, all kinds of crazy stuff. And I think Paul shows exactly what he's talking about when he talks about ordinances here. 
The big question is, what are the ordinances that were taken out of the way and nailed to the cross? Note, the verse in Colossians 2.14 does not say Jesus took the handwriting out of the way and nailed it to his cross, but the handwriting of the ordinances. Context will teach us what Paul is referencing, whether he is meaning our legal sin debt or something else. Paul continues to talk in Colossians 2.16. Look at Colossians 2.16. Let no man therefore. What does therefore mean? When you read the word therefore, yours may read it a little different way. What, is your, what does yours say? Mine just says, let no one judge you in food or drink. Mm-hmm. That, you could, that's a perfectly right way to interpret that. Mine says therefore. I like the way it does that because it shows the connection of what he was just saying. Paul said this, Colossians 2, 13 and 14. Therefore, Colossians 2.16. So now, if this all means right here, our legal sin debt was nailed to the cross, why does Paul say and talk this way in Colossians 2.16? Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in what you drink, or in what day you worship, or in the new moons, or in the Sabbath days, which were only shadows. Of things to come but the real body is of Christ the real deal the real real is Jesus all of this other stuff Jews that made you so unique and different and separate from your Gentile brothers and all the enmity between you and the Gentiles you couldn't stand them they were dogs all that made you so unique your food ordinances your drink ordinances the days you worshiped doesn't mean nothing now was nailed to the cross with Jesus when he died. The enmity between you and Gentiles, slain. And people that were real legal, but weren't with any grace, that's why they killed Paul. He's trying to, all these apostles, they're saying Jesus is going to tear down the temple and raise it up again in three days. Oh, they, they, they even accused Paul of changing the law. He's trying to subvert the law of Moses. Because they saw... What day I worship, and what I'm eating, and what I'm drinking, and all that. And they didn't see beyond anything that all that pointed to. And when the Jesus it pointed to was in front of them, they completely stumbled over and missed it. And what separated Jews and Gentiles in their relationship being one, and this big circle represents Jesus, what separated them, Jesus took out of the way and nailed it to his cross. Not sin debt. Because the Bible says in Romans 2, 5, sinners in their sin are still treasuring up sin debt to be revealed and executed on them in the day of wrath. Romans 2, 6 through 8. They're still keeping up debt they owe to God in their sin. So if the debt's still increasing, it must not have been paid. That doesn't make sense. Another reason that doesn't make sense is because Acts 3, 19 says that our debt is blotted out when we repent and we believe the gospel, not at the cross. This is where people today get this way of thinking. Jesus died for me, so I'm good. I've had people say, Jesus died for our sins, so sin all you want. He died for sin. Preacher said Jesus died for sin. Preacher told me Jesus paid for my sins. I'm good. They're not wrong, logically, if that were what the Bible really said. And it's not what it says here. But people will take this verse to teach that our sin debt was completely removed at the cross out of context of what Paul's talking about. What does Paul mention? Colossians 2.16. He mentions food ordinances, drink ordinances, days you worship ordinances. And I can show, or we will look at, the New Testament is full of Paul making this point. That things like this are what were removed. But the law of love is still binding on us today. It's what's always been. This is not the law of love. This is commandments contain ordinances. The law of love, I can assure you, has never been abolished and it will always be. It's in the nature of things and the way that God, who God is and the way he made us in his image. 
So my point in saying all this is to say this relates to our discussion of atonement. It relates to our discussion in Ephesians 2. The ordinances that Paul removed out of the way, so that, or Jesus, so that Jesus can make one new man, so making peace are things like this. So, we see here, Paul, what does Paul say? Wherefore, if you be dead in, with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you still subject to ordinances, Paul said? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all going to perish with the using. After the commandments and doctrines of men. What are the ordinances that Jesus took out of the way? According to context, Paul had in mind the idea of meat, drink, what day you worship, new moons and Sabbath days, with the idea of touch not, taste not, handle not. You tracking with where I'm going? We read on down in Colossians 2, verse 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility in the worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Let no man therefore judge you, or sorry, verse 19, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment, ministered, and knit together, increased with the increase of God. Verse 20, wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you still subject to ordinances? There's that word. What was bought out of the way and nailed to the cross with Jesus? The important document of ordinances. Paul defines what these ordinances are. Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglect of your body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. What are these ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using. That made the Jew uniquely different from the Gentile. Are you seeing where I'm going with this? What was nailed to the cross is so important to understand. Because this reemphasizes my point I've been making in our study of Ephesians, that Paul's big, per, Paul's big point Romans 6, or Romans 9, John 6, Ephesians 1, all these Calvinistic or Reformed sections where they try to use to glorify the elect against the non-elect. Paul's point is the Jew and the Gentile. And how Jesus came to save them all. And he did so in making peace in his church so that we're not going to have a Jew church and a Gentile church on Wednesday and a Jew church on Sunday. Jesus wanted a church, one body, and the way he did that was abolishing the touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using ordinances and commandments of men. Because there's a lot of stuff in the Old Testament God didn't say. Hundreds of things. Hundreds of things. So, you see, they took it and they went way over to the other side of the board and began to add into and interpret God's words with extra stuff, which was not nobody was able to keep because they made the law of God impossible. Though it wasn't, because what God said was reasonable, what they said was unreasonable. Why would Paul be bringing up the point that Jesus had removed meat, drink, respect of holy day, new moon, and Sabbath day ideas? Because Paul's big point in a lot of his writing was the mystery of Christ. And this mystery, which Paul says was hidden for ages but revealed in the last time. And what was this mystery? Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in the church, Ephesians 5.32. The mystery to which Paul often references is the idea that Jews and Gentiles would be brought together into one body in Christ. The mystery revealed would be that Christ is the fullness. Christ is the head of the body, and the body is the church made up of the faithful brethren in Christ, Colossians 1-2, and the faithful in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1-1. Paul's big point in much of what he writes about is that Jews and Gentiles have become one as they are both in Christ. This is Paul's point in Romans 9, Ephesians 1, Colossians 2, etc., 
All three of these chapters Reformed thinkers have resorted to in order to defend their sordid doctrines like limited atonement, unconditional election, and perseverance of the saints. Reformed thinkers are always misusing Paul's teachings to their own destruction, as Peter said some would do. What separated the Jews from the Gentile world? How they ate, how they drank, and the way they worshipped. What caused problems in the church in keeping Jews and Gentiles from working together? Oftentimes it was dietary disagreements. We could read 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 13, 1 Corinthians 10, 28, Acts 15, 29. Remember whenever Peter was eating with the Gentiles and then the leaders of the Jews walked into the room and Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore? He ran over there to eat with the, Je the Jews. And that caused the division in the church. And Paul rebuked Peter to his face for causing a division in the church of God by doing that. Well, why did Paul do that? Didn't he realize the Gentiles are just so dirty in how they eat? And they eat things offered to idols? And they, uh, and they eat pork? And they wear mixed fabrics? And they eat shrimp? Didn't Paul realize how dirty the, Jew, the Gentiles were? That was Paul's point. Paul understood the mystery. That God is making one. Food and dietary habits have become such an issue in Galatia that Paul had to oppose Peter to his face because Peter had left off eating with Gentiles when he saw the Jews. This causing a division. Uh, Peter's blamed for causing a division. Acts chapter 15, the, Gentile, the Jewish leaders met together to discuss whether or not they're going to have a Jew or a Gentile church. Compare Acts 15, 1 and Galatians 5, 3. What was obligatory on a Gentile who had become a Christian? Many Jews had struggled to let go of their touch-not, taste-not, handle-not mindset and after a while left off the simplicity of the gospel to go back to the ordinances of the law that had respect to meat, drink, and uh, respect of holy day, new moon, and Sabbath day convictions and began to impose their Jewish convictions, mind you convictions, upon new Gentile converts. This was causing a division in the church where you now had Jews, Christians, and Gentile Christians. Paul was grieved by this division, often addressed it in his writings to the churches, which were often made up of a mix of both Jew and Gentile. It is important to Paul to communicate to the Jews what they ought not to impose, that they ought not to impose these ideas of the ordinances of men, like food, drink, and respect of holy day, new moon, and Sabbath days upon the Gentiles. Gentiles did not need to become Jews, then become Christians is Paul's point. And it was also important for Paul to communicate to the Gentiles to not do things that offended their Jewish brothers. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 13. So Jews had a responsibility to not impose their convictions on Gentiles. Gentiles in the church had a responsibility to not do things that would offend the Jews. You see how he's trying to get them to think both of them responsibility about how to be one together? Understanding this guy's convictions... And my freedom, I don't want my freedom to cause him to stumble. Paul mentions that in Romans 14. Paul states in Romans 14 this, Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean by itself. But to him that thinks that something is unclean, to him it's unclean. But if your brother be grieved with what, with what you eat, you do not walk charitably if you so eat it. Destroy not a man with your meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is not in meat. The kingdom of God is not in drink. But the kingdom of God is in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serves Christ, he is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after these things, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, which leads to peace, and things wherewith one may edify and build up another. For meat, for meat, do not destroy the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for a man who eats with offense." Are you hearing what Paul's saying? Follow after righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Because my goodness, the kingdom of God is not in meat and it's not in drink. The ordinances of men. 
It's not in this. This is not the kingdom of God. So don't destroy your brother who's offended if you eat it. And don't destroy the Gentile because they don't have the conviction you have to eat it. That's what Paul's talking about. Not sin debt. Not that the law doesn't exist anymore. Not that there's no such thing as sin. Or not that Jesus only died for some and not everybody else. Really simple. Let the Bible speak for itself. People are like, Jesus Jesus on the cross nailed dietary laws to the cross? That is ridiculous. Jesus did so much more than that. That is dumb to interpret it that way. It appears to me that's what the Bible says. Not good eat meat and drink in respect of a holy day, new moon, or Sabbath days, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit is God's mission in the world. That's the kingdom of God. That's what separated Jews and Gentiles and the mystery Jesus sought to achieve was to have one through his blood shed on the cross. But in order to get that oneness, not only in name, but in their hearts, was to abolish that which separated them. The new covenant in comparison to the old. He was going to win their hearts through the grace of the cross, but he was going to make it so that they had no excuse but to be one by abolishing that which separated them. And that's the ordinances of men. We're almost done. It's my last point. Paul wanted the Jews to see that they are Christians, that they as Christians had been made one with Gentiles who were becoming Christians. The Jews needed to see, the, the Jews needed to see that the handwriting of ordinances was blotted out that they might see that Christ had abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the laws of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of two one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both Jew and Gentile unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity that was between them. And he came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were near, Jew and Gentile. For through him we both have that access by one spirit unto the Father. Both of us, Jew and Gentile. Compare Colossians 2.3 with Ephesians 2.3 and you will see many stark similarities. Paul's point in addressing the Jew-Gentile division in the church was to get them to see, get them both to see the mystery. Christ in you, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. Christ in the Jewish believer and Christ in the Gentile believer. That they together would understand that they are fellow citizens. Fellow citizens. Both of you, with the saints. Can you imagine this being preached to the Jew-Gentile church? Everybody's sitting around. The leader of the church assembly is there. Paul's letter is delivered. He sits up there and he begins to read it. And everybody starts squirming. And I told Demetrius he was eating pork the other day. And that wasn't that was offensive to God. And I, I, wore, I ate shrimp the other day in front of the Jew lady over there. And she got offended. And all this stuff starts squirming. Try to get them both to see your fellow citizens with the saints because the mystery is not this. This is not the end game. The end game is this. But they were so stuck on this. They missed this. Completely missed it. And they missed the fact what separated them as Jew, what separated them Gentile from Jew, was abolished on the cross when Jesus nailed it to the tree in his atoning death. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he came to abolish and slay the enmity that separated. He, when he died, he made that one path whereby we may be saved. One name given under heaven is Jesus. Not if you eat a certain day or you don't eat something or if you worship on Wednesday and not Tuesday. Like every cult in the world gets like, they say if you worship on Saturday, you're going to hell. If you worship on Sunday, then you're not saved. If you still eat pork, you're going to hell. And countless, we've known people who were Christians who fell back into Jewish ordinances thinking that that was the way that they were to be saved. We know one guy right there in Calixburg. Great young guy. Started hanging around Jewish people who are still stuck on the ordinances. Now he's, he thinks the whole church is going to hell and that he's the only one and Jews are the only ones that are going to be saved. And if you're not living like a Jew, you're, di you're, you're disobeying God. And this is what they always do. They fall back to ordinances, but miss the point. Miss the point. Jew and Gentile, one together. The handwriting of the ordinances that separate us was nailed to the tree. So, 
The handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, was removed out of the way. The us and the we are Jew and Gentile who have been made one in ordinances, no, but in Christ. Who are the faithful made up of in Jesus, Jews and Gentiles? And these ordinances which Christ took out of the way, having fulfilled the law himself, were nailed to the cross. Yet as we read the New Testament, we can't help but tell that many Jews were not getting that important point. Therefore, many divisions continuously sprung up in what God was trying to do. Make one new man, according to Ephesians 2.15. It is not the moral law which Paul is speaking of in Colossians 2.14, which has been done away with, else nobody today could sin. For where there is no law, there is no sin. Neither is the handwriting our legal sin debt, as that is not what these verses are saying. Neither does context support that conclusion. Paul goes on to urge the Colossians, Colossian believers, who were both Jews and Gentiles, to put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is the all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness and humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, Jew and Gentile, and forgiving one another, Jew and Gentile. If any man have a quarrel against any, Jew or Gentile, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body. Colossians 3, 10 through 15. The Colossians who had been saved, whether Jew or Gentile, also needed to see that the middle wall of partition that separated them had been broken down between them, that the handwriting of ordinances which separated them had been nailed to the cross. Colossians 2.14, therefore, has nothing to do with our sin debt being nailed to the cross, therefore unconditionally saving all those for whom Jesus nailed the debt. The new covenant had come. Gentiles did not need to become Jews in their practice to be saved by Christ. This is Paul's point in mentioning that the handwriting of ordinances have been nailed to the cross, which was contrary to the mission of joining Jews and Gentiles into one body, so making peace. Chorygraphon simply means something written by hand, a written document. The written document of ordinances were nailed to the cross, ordinances being what Paul mentions in Colossians 2.16 and Colossians 2.20-22. And that being conclusion... What separated Jew and Gentile was nailed to the cross when Christ died because Christ then dying on the cross became that way whereby we must be saved. Not through the ordinances, but through his shed blood at Calvary and his grace revealed in it. So we do not have to become Jews in order to be saved. Neither do Jews have to become Gentiles in order to be saved. And that we should no longer also impose our convictions on one another when they're not God's verbal or like exact moral law. So that which separated Jews from Gentiles is what was taken out of the way and nailed to the tree. And that's important for us to get so that we don't misinterpret the cross to think that, oh, well, he only died for certain people's sin debt or that the sin debt of the elect was nailed to the cross. I've heard people read that verse that way, and it's not even, that's adding to the verse. So uh, I wanted to talk about that because it's where we were at in Ephesians 2. It's where we've been at in our discussion of the atonement. And I thought it was really important to get that. That what separated Jew and Gentile was what was nailed to the tree. Because Jesus, when he died on the tree, became the one under which we all must hide ourselves. I've actually been in churches that have actually preached that, that Jesus died, the debt was paid, that what you were talking about. I've actually, I mean, they, I didn't know any better until I started reading it. Right. How we were raised. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will tell you this, that in the western part of the world, which basically is like America, a lot of Europe, the, 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 the word penal substitution, which is a view of the cross, is that Jesus paid the debt. That has dominated for about the last 1,200 years. It's, it's, it's waxed and it's waned in its influence over the church. But that view is really predominant because of the Reformation. The Roman Catholic Church was corrupt, it still is, but at the time it was very corrupt. And the Reformers like Martin Luther, John Calvin and others broke off from them. They formed a view of the Atonement called Penal Substitution. And whenever they formed the Reformation, that's where we stem from as Protestant <coughs> people. So. I would challenge that never is there a single verse, and there isn't in the Bible that says the sin that was paid for. Your debt is forgiven if you follow Jesus, but it's not paid for. 
But you see the issue with telling people sin debt's paid for. Hey, your past, present, and future sins are paid for. So anything I do now that's wrong doesn't affect my relationship with God. I can go get drunk, do whatever I want to do, all I want to, because how am I say that's paid for, preacher? I'm good. That's where the white and gray always in grace comes from. Correct. So you're 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 tracking logically with what happens when you get the Bible off just a little bit or a lot of it. And it'll take this one verse, like Colossians 2, 13, 14, to teach that. And what's the conclusion? Well, if people go to hell, then their sin debt must not have been paid for by Jesus. So Jesus didn't die for everybody. So then if we don't know that he died for everybody, who has assurance that he died for you? <laughs> you have no assurance at all. So truly being assured of your salvation has to do with a universal atonement that he died. I know he died for Delina. I know he died for Gavin. I know he died for me. But if you hold this kind of view, you cannot be sure that he died for you. How do you know he paid for your sin debt? You might just feel like you're saved, but maybe he didn't die for your sin debt. So even though you're being religious and going to church, you're just, feel it, you're just feeling it just to realize at the end, nope, I didn't die for you. Well, 1 John chapter 2 tells you that you know you can know you can know because how do you know that, you're, that you belong to him if you keep his commandments? Absolutely. You do those things that are pleasing in his sight. There was that sudden shift. I remember after I first got saved, I used to cuss all the time, like constant, whenever I was lost. And immediately, like, after I knew Jesus, is like, I just, I couldn't do that. It was like, just automatic change. Like, I'd be tempted, and I would almost say something or whatever, but it was like, it was just a sudden shift of, I didn't want to do anything that was wrong anymore that I used to do. Even if I struggled to overcome in some areas of my life, and I was battling, my whole heart was after God. Not just a little bit of me. Not just a, the Sunday me. But I wanted to know God every day. And things vied for my attention to get me off track from that. But it was that hungering and that pursuing of Him. And so, uh, you know, this is really important to see in context of what Paul said there. Now, I want you to just always remember this when you're reading these verses here. Paul's point is food, drink, and days of worship. And that's what separated Jew from Gentile and made them so unique. And that's what kept them separate. And that's what Paul came to abolish. Because the kingdom of God, Paul said, is not in what? Food, drink, or respect of a holy day. It was the ceremonial he did away with rather than the moral. Exactly. So it, it's what made them unique as a nation, as a people. It was not Jew salvation. It was salvation in Jesus the head, the chief cornerstone. And that's what Paul wanted them both to see as Jews and Gentiles. Amen. Does anyone have any questions about that or anything?